Today is the feast day of St. Macrina the Younger, July 19th. And I want to just talk a little bit about her because she is my confirmation saint. She lived during the, like, the middle of the 4th century. And I'm, I'm not going to give, like, a whole bio or anything on her, but I just want to just say a, things, some, a few important points that I think were interesting. She was the oldest of 10 children. She was the granddaughter. She came from a whole family of saints. She was a granddaughter of Saint Macrina the Elder, the daughter of Saint Emilia, and the older sister of Saint Gregory of Nyssa, who is a doctor of the church, Saint Peter of Sebast, and Saint Basil the Great. And she, when she was young, she had been betrothed to, um, sounds like he was a, a competitive forensic debater, which I think is awesome. Um, and apparently he used to engage in competitions uh, in defense of, of uh, uh, vulnerable individuals, in defense of justice. And before they got married, though, she was betrothed to him, but before they got married, he ended up dying young. And she decided that she wanted to treat it as though she had actually been married to him um, and remain faithful to him, so to speak, as though they had been married. So she decided to try to live her life in, like, holy celibate widowhood. Even though she was just a girl at the time. She was, you know, probably a teenager. And, um, which I think is just a cool concept that she's, you know, obviously that's not morally uh, incumbent upon a woman to do that, but that's, that's cool that she's doing that. Um, so she, she, with the intention of remaining faithful to her original betrothed, even though they weren't actually married, she, uh, remained a virgin for the rest of her life and lived a life like the religious, uh, like the nuns. Um, but she didn't, it wasn't in a, a, an, an official community. She actually ended up, like, it wasn't a women's religious community. She ended up going back, staying home with her mother, and encouraging her mother after her father passed away, um, which I get the impression they were fairly well off, but she encouraged her mother to start living uh, more ascetic practices um, and was very much influential in her mother's pursuit of, of virtue um, in this kind of ascetic living. And she helped raise her younger siblings, and obviously with great success, because uh, three of them were canonized saints. Um, maybe the rest of them were all saints, even if they weren't canonized. And one of them was a doctor of the church. And um, St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote a, it was in the form of a letter, but it's just a short treatise singing the praises of his older sister and talking about how she was greatly influential in their, their upbringing, in their, pursuit, in their training to pursue holiness, and in their intellectual training. Um, sometimes she's called um, the philosopher, Macrina the philosopher. And she's pictured with a scroll, and as I understand, that's in, in iconography that is symbolized, symbolizing her pursuit of philosophy. Um, I hope I got that right. I'm pretty sure that's what that is, um, which I think is cool. But she she encouraged them to the pursuit of philosophy, and uh, her younger siblings kind of followed in her footsteps, and she assisted them in that. So what ended up happening is she kind of, with her mother, encouraged her mother, and the, and the two of them sort of set up a, a religious community at their home at Anissa. And... It's not clear to me exactly how it functioned on a practical level, like, you know, because I get the impression that at least at least one of her brothers lived with them, so it wasn't like like a separate men's and women's religious community. I think I got the impression it was just more of like a family sort of unit, but it was like, but they were living like the religious life, like a, like a community of nuns or monks might do. Um, she would pray, pray the, you know, the, the Psalms, um, which I gotta see, I, I, See, I don't know my history well enough. At what point the Liturgy of the Hours became a um, like an official church practice. Obviously, the, the praying of the Psalms at particular hours during the day is an ancient practice. Um, so she was at least doing that. i got to make a video on that sometime, the, the praying Liturgy of the Hours. But she did that even as a young girl. Um, she lo loved memorizing scripture, you know, learning, learning, uh, learning philosophy. Her brother records um, in this this letter he wrote, which is called The Life of Macrina, talking about his sister, um, that shortly before her death, he wanted to go visit her. It had been almost a decade since he last visited her, and he decided he wanted to go see her again. And on his way, he ended up having a, a dream that he took to be some, somehow prophetic, but he didn't, didn't know how, um, about holding the relics of some martyr, I think it was. And he ended up realizing that somehow it seemed prophetic of his, of his sister, 
who passed away shortly after he reached um, their home and saw her again. But I'm just going to read as the last bit here that he has recorded her final prayer right before her death. So from her deathbed. Um, he's, he writes, Right up to her last breath, she philosophized with a lofty mind on the convictions she had formed from the beginning about the life here below. Once again, dispersed our grief of soul with those beautiful words of hers. Okay, so here's her, her, here's her final prayer. I'm just reading from Life of Macrina here. This is Macrina's prayer. It is you, O Lord, she said, who have freed us from the fear of death. You who have made the end of our life here the beginning of true life for us. You who put our bodies to rest and sleep a little while and will waken them again at the last trumpet. You who return our earth fashioned by your hands to the earth for safekeeping and will retrieve again what you once gave, transforming what is mortal and unseemly in us with immortality and grace. You who have rescued us from the curse and from sin, having become both for our sakes. You who have shattered the head of the dragon, who had seized man in his jaws and dragged him into the yawning abyss of disobedience. You who have opened up for us the way to the resurrection, having trampled down the gates of Hades and brought him who had the power over death to naught. You who have given a sign to those who fear you, the symbol of the Holy Cross, to destroy the adversary and to secure our life. O God, the Eternal One, to whom I have cleaved from my mother's womb, whom my soul has loved with all its strength, to whom I have dedicated my flesh and my soul from youth even until now, send an angel of light to be by my side to guide me to the place of refreshment, to the water of repose in the bosom of the Holy Fathers. You who averted the flame of the fiery sword and brought to paradise the man who was co-crucified with you and implored your mercies, remember me too in your kingdom, since I too was co-crucified with you, having nailed my flesh in the fear of you, for I have feared your judgments. Do not let the terrible abyss sunder me from your elect, or the slanderer stand in the way to oppose me, or my sin be uncovered before your eyes. If I have sinned in word or deed or thought, let astray in some way through the weakness of our nature. Let us stray in some way through the weakness of our nature. O you who have power on earth to forgive sins, spare me that I may revive, and as I put off my body, be found before you without stain or blemish in the form of my soul. But may my soul be received into your hands, blameless and undefiled, as an incense offering in your sight. As she spoke these words, she traced the seal on her eyes and mouth and heart, So, well, first of all, I just want to say in that prayer, um, there's scripture references, either direct quotes or just references of scripture, like all the way through that, um, which I think is interesting because it's, it shows how deeply she allowed herself to be formed by these words that they would come to mind effortlessly. They would come into her speaking. They would pop up in her speaking effortlessly. So even when she's on her deathbed and speaking her final words, there's scripture pouring out of her mouth, you know, from the, from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's scripture just pouring out of her mouth uh, effortlessly because she spent her whole life dedicated to God and studying these things. And pay attention when people are speaking as a side note. From the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, pay attention to when people are speaking, what continues to pop up in, in, their, in their thoughts and in their, in their words. You know, what are the things that, are, that they return to? examine yourself and see what are the things that come back to you you know are the things that that pop up continuously uh things that have to do with god that are uplifting that are you know whatever is good whatever is pure whatever is just think only on these things is that first corinthians or something um or are they profane things are they ugly things are they you know uh sinful things etc so anyway saint macrina the younger was obviously very thoroughly um saturated with with this uh, with the love of god and the study of god particularly the study of god I would recommend that, or it seems to me, St. Macrina the Younger is a wonderful intercessor to look to for help with ministering to your family, because that was a big thing, is that she was very devoted to her family. She was devoted to God, but very much in the context of helping her family and trying to encourage her family to pursue holiness. So talking about um, love is care real love is caring about the highest good of of a person so if the thing she's most concerned for with her family is their highest good the good of their souls their pursuit of holiness they're becoming the best versions of themselves that they can possibly be that's a really loving woman who truly was devoted and loved her family 
So I think she's great for, for people who are uh, with who who are in a very tangible, direct way dealing with their family and, and um, wanting to love their family better. Um, particularly, uh, this is just one particular way. Is, uh, well, actually, I, I'm not even going to say particularly. She particularly, though, uh, was ministered to her mother and to her siblings. So for a sister or a daughter, um, that would be a particular thing to look to. Also, I think it's interesting that, that the fidelity that she had, that at least, at least at the beginning, it was it was ostensibly. I mean, it was devotion to God, but it was ostensibly out of fidelity to her betrothed, her fiance, who died. So, that kind of fidelity to a beloved that you don't get anything out of tangibly, you know, where it's not like it's it's fidelity to somebody that you love that you are getting no pleasure out of because either they're absent or perhaps she could be an intercessor in a situation where the person that you are you know married to or whatever is not doing their part. They're not being a good spouse or something. Um, so I think it's not too much of a stretch to say she could be a powerful intercessor for someone who is trying to be faithful to someone who is has nothing to offer them or won't offer them anything. And then just the study, in, uh, the study of philosophy, the, the pursuit of philosophy in a philosophical life, uh, living your life in line with truth as much as possible, whatever your circumstances are. Um, she's a great intercessor for that. She particularly lived this out in a very ascetic way. Um, so, so if you're seeking to live your life with greater asceticism and, and to help yourself become detached from material things, she's um, an excellent intercessor, I think, for that as well. So, yeah, that's Saint Macrina the Younger. She's been my my uh, heavenly friend, I suppose, um, since I was a teenager. She's cool.